Now in our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1168 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The FCC has just released a circulation draft and is poised to give the thumbs up to FM mode on 11 meter CB. We will have all the details. The ARRL this week held its rededication ceremony. We will take you there. The results from field day continue to pour into league headquarters. Most amateurs entered as class D. We will bring you the results so far. Ham Radio Outlet announces where in the United States it'll open a brand new store. Youth on the Air Campers operated special event W8Y and had a successful Aeros contact. We will tell you all about it. The Swiss Spectrum Regulator, Ofcom, is proposing to charge amateurs for access to that country's new amateur radio satellite. American comedian Red Skelton is honored with a special event station and the end of an era happened this week as the very last analog television broadcast station shut down in the United States. We will have that story and a lot more coming up in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will reminisce about old stuff from the early days of the net that you can still find and try out on the Internet Archive. He will touch on the billionaires racing each other into space, and will have an update on the recent Kaseya ransomware attack. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, is wondering what open source means to the amateur service and why this is important. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill continues his look at amateur radio's fallen flags, with part three of the series, this week taking a nostalgic look back at the history of Hammerland. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, gets back to tower climbing this week with a look at tower climbing belts. And... In remembering America's most trusted news personality, we will have a retrospective look back at the life and career of KB2GSD, better known as CBS News anchor Walter Cronkite. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Albany, New York, where just this week we had a rainstorm bringing us 4.25 inches of rain in the space of about two hours. Yes, there was flooding. I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the news desk in Half Moon, New York, where despite having enough surge suppressors to fill a dump truck, the lightning has been systematically removing my electronics one piece at a time. I'll get you, Mother Nature. I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from along the southern shore of Lake Ontario in soggy Rochester, New York, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our station in the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where the first sweet corn has come into the farm down the road and our own sweet corn isn't far behind, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from a boiling hot Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where it was 69 degrees a couple of mornings ago. Wait, what? 69 degrees? In the middle of July? In Arkansas? This is nuts! And I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. Wondering what alternate reality I find myself in now. And now with our lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. We have late breaking news this week, and this comes to us courtesy of REC Networks and Michelle Bradley, KU3N. Normally, three weeks prior to the monthly open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission, the agency releases drafts of the items they will be voting on in the next meeting. These circulation drafts are not the exact wording of the final decisions, but they're a good sneak preview on what's to come. 
The FCC is planning to vote on granting three petitions for reconsideration in the Part 95 Personal Radio Services in WT Docket 10-119. According to the circulation draft, the Commission intends to grant reconsideration to Motorola, who had proposed that GMRS and FRS units be permitted to send automatic data transmissions of location information, as well as the ability to send short text messages. Also, according to the circulation draft, the Commission may approve a request by medical device maker Medtronic to fix some rule language as it applies to Med Radio Service, an ultra-low power radio service for the transmission of non-voice data for the purpose of facilitating diagnostic and or therapeutic functions involving implanted and body-worn medical devices. But the most interesting of these petitions was the one by Cobra that originally asked the FCC to permit FM emissions in the 27 MHz Citizens Band. Frequency modulation has been used for decades on 11 meters in many parts of Europe. The FCC originally rejected the idea of FMCB because it would, in their words, change the fundamental nature of the radio service, but now they've taken a new position that FMCB would not change the nature of the service and would improve the customer experience. Under the proposed revised rules, FM mode, like AM, will be limited to 4 watts. Radios will be limited to a plus or minus 2 kHz deviation, which matches the European telecommunications standard. There will be no expansion to the 40 channels in the service, and there will be no restrictions on which of the 40 channels FM operations can take place. In order to assure and maintain service compatibility, the FCC will require that any CB radio marketed in the United States with FM mode must also have AM. This news comes at a time when conditions on the 10-meter amateur radio service band have been improving as SolarCycle 25 gets underway. This will also improve the ability to shoot skip in the 11-meter citizens band. FM operations in the 10-meter amateur radio service band are mainly conducted on the spectrum between 29.5 and 29.7 MHz. Unlike CB, amateur radio is permitted to operate repeaters on 10-meter FM. Also, in order to be legal, all FMCB radios must be FCC certified and have an FCC ID number. This does not mean that radios that have been illegally imported into the United States are legal. In addition, uncertified transceivers for the amateur radio service are not legal on the Part 95 CB frequencies. The FCC's open meeting will be on Tuesday, August 5, 2021, and will be streamed live on the FCC's YouTube channel and at FCC.gov forward slash live. On Thursday, July 15th, at 10 a.m. EDT, ARRL headquarters in Newington, Connecticut, hosted a rededication ceremony recognizing ARRL's commitment to all radio amateurs who enhance the communications capability and security of the nation. WW1ME files this report from ARRL headquarters. The event coincided with the attendance of ARRL's all-volunteer board of directors who had traveled in from across the country for in-person committee and board meetings this week. ARRL President Rick Roderick was among the speakers. ARRL operating events and contests are driving on the air participation at a high level, encouraging members to develop their stations and practice their skills. We are increasing the visibility of ham radio in our communities through good work of ARRL radio clubs, volunteer examiners, and our field organization volunteers. Roderick also recognized members of ARRL's Amateur Radio Emergency Service, or ARIES, for serving their communities with essential communications when all else fails. In his remarks, ARRL CEO David Minster, NA2AA, reflected on the commitment made to maintain the organization's operations for the benefit of its members during the pandemic. The last year has been difficult on all of us and our families. We had to learn new ways to work together, and we did. Each of you can take great pride in all we do together here in Newington. They say if you live long enough, you'll see everything at least once. In the 107 year history of our humble association, it has lived long enough to survive not its first, but now second global pandemic. In that time, we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly that life can represent. Representatives of the IARU and Radio Amateurs of Canada were among the luminaries on hand. A video of the rededication ceremony is posted on ARRL's YouTube channel. 
I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The event also included remarks by Connecticut District 1 U.S. Congressman John B. Larson, Connecticut State Senator Matt Lessel, and Glenn A. Field, KB1GHX, Warning Coordination Meteorologist for the National Weather Service Boston Norton Office in Massachusetts. Also in attendance were representatives of the American Red Cross, the Connecticut Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection, the International Amateur Radio Union, Radio Amateurs of Canada, Connecticut General Assembly, the Town of Newington, and ARRL officers, board members, and staff. A video of the rededication ceremony is posted on ARRL's YouTube channel. In the second year in which the rule waivers were in place for ARRL Field Day, some 4,815 entries were received at ARRL headquarters by July 13th. The majority in Class D as home stations. With more details, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files the special report. Last year saw more than 10,200 entries in all and nearly 18,900 participants. Before the pandemic in 2019, some 3,100 entries were submitted with 36,420 total participants. As contest program manager Paul Bork and 1SFE observed, discussions he's had with participants this year suggested that even though some groups gathered in larger numbers this year, many participants chose either to gather in smaller groups or to operate solo from home as Class D or Class E stations. With the entry submission deadline looming, the tally of participants reported is 16,166 they made just north of a million total contacts. Field day entries must be submitted online or postmarked no later than 2059 UTC on July 27th. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Andy Goss, AA5JF, took part in the first ever field day for the Augusta University Amateur Radio Club, WA4AUG, which set up in the Georgia School's Critical Event Preparedness and Response Center. Field day was already a success on Saturday with the stations working smoothly and lots of local visitors dropping by. An hour after sunrise on Sunday, we were counting our points when Darby, KK4PEQ, announced he had just worked a station on 6-meter phone just playing around on 50 megahertz using the 2015-10 Tribander, Goss said. He stayed on 6 for 5 QSOs, but we quickly moved to 10 and 15, finding those bands were open to just about everywhere, and we doubled our score in just 3 hours. What a rush! There's still time to submit your 2021 field day entry. Most of this year's field day entries have been submitted online worth 50 bonus points, although some 50 paper logs have been mailed in. Participants can check the Entries Received page to make sure their entries were received and complete. If the entry status indicates pending documents, either the required dupe sheet or in lieu of that a Gorillo log file or supporting documentation of claimed bonus points is missing. Burke said some 250 entries fall into that category right now. Participants can add documentation or edit their entries by following the link provided in the confirmation email sent to the email address provided upon entry up until the entry submission deadline. Field day entries must be submitted online or postmarked no later than 2059 UTC on July 27, 2021. The breakdown of field day entries by class as of July 13th showed 4,815 total entries, with 613 in Class A, 582 in Class B, 57 in Class C Mobile, 2,619 in Class D, 858 in Class E, and 86 in Class F. For his 2021 field day, Scott Hanley, WA9STI, took to the woods, the Los Padres National Forest, at a site some 7,400 feet elevation in the mountains overlooking California's Central Valley. He operated as WA6LE in Class 1B. 
He put 358 contacts in the log on CW and phone, short of his 400 contact goal. Almost all activity was on 20, 40, and 75, 80 meters to a G5 RV or NFED 20 meter dipole, Hanley said. Six meters did not open, so only had two local SSB contacts and only three contacts on two meter FM. Ham Radio Outlet, the nationwide amateur radio retailer in the U.S., has announced that its ongoing expansion plans will include a store in the state of Florida. The new store will join 12 already open in such states as California in the west, where the company is based, to Delaware in the east, Arizona and Texas in the south, and New Hampshire in the north. The company's announcement on social media set off a wave of speculation about the new location, especially on Instagram, where the company wrote that, we're not telling yet, we're open to suggestions though. The closest ham radio outlet to Florida is in Atlanta, Georgia. The company, which calls itself the world's largest supplier of amateur radio equipment, is also known for shipping internationally. In other amateur radio business news, the Dayton Daily News reports that Sandy Mendelson, founder of the legendary Ohio Electronics retail store Mendelson's Liquidation Outlet, died on July 3rd at the age of 77. The downtown Dayton location, which was for decades a magnet for local and visiting hams, especially during the hamvention, closed its doors in late 2019. His eight-story building was sold to a Columbus, Ohio developer. The IARU monitoring report is always worth a look at, and it shows us who's encroaching on our amateur bands, even though it may be less than easy to do something about it. This month's newsletter singles out the usual culprits, and as the higher HF bands liven up, we're beginning to see some new illegal operators. Does anyone remember the Russian taxis on 10 metres during the last solar maximum? Well, I'll bet they'll be back with a vengeance soon too. The latest IARU Region 1 Monitoring System newsletter reports that over-the-horizon radars are still the main nuisance for radio amateurs. And with the summer propagation conditions, and thanks to several sporadic E-layer events known as ES for short, numerous driftnet radio buoys and other fishing gear were heard again in the 10-metre band, illegally serving the marking of fishing nets at sea. They can mostly be received between 28 and 28.45 MHz at the lower end of the 10-metre amateur band, their transmissions being short but sent repeatedly every few minutes all day long. For identification, a short letter code is transmitted in Morse, consisting of one to three letters. You can read the full International Amateur Radio Union Monitoring System Region 1 newsletter at www.iaru-r1.org. And if you want to have a go at identifying military data transmissions, there are numerous recordings which can be found on the Signal Identification Guide Wiki at www.sigidwiki.com. That's www.sigidwiki.com. And you can learn more about the IARU monitoring team's work by visiting their website, www.iarums-r1.org. The first Youth on the Air camp for young radio amateurs in North, Central, and South America took place in Westchester, Ohio. The camp's opening observance this past Sunday featured keynote speaker Tim Duffy, K3LR, who told the campers, Amateur radio is the best hobby in the world. For more details, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from ARRL headquarters. Among other activities, campers operated special event station W8Y from both the National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting and from the Camp Hotel. Camp Director Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, was pleased at how things were going at midweek. Um, but yeah, it, it's gone really well. It's chomping at the bit to get on the air. The uh, space station contact went flawlessly this morning, finished all the questions and had about 10 seconds left. And then we've been in silent doing the uh, VHF contests within the park. We're getting along fabulously well, which is one of our big goals. Got them in, in like age groups. Rap said he's hoping this pilot camp venture will provide the information needed to replicate the camp over multiple locations for years to come. We also hope this brings a more robust community of young hams into amateur radio, he said. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The camp wrapped up with an hour-long closing ceremony on Friday, July 16th. 
Things went really well, said Camp Director Neil Rapp, WB9VPG. The earlier launch of a balloon carrying a ham radio payload was successful, he said, and after pinpointing where the payload landed some three hours away, the campers were able to retrieve the package thanks to some understanding landowners. Rapp said the balloon reached approximately 100,000 feet. Rapp said that campers have gotten along well from the first day, and problems in general have been few and minor. Several of the approximately two dozen campers got to ask questions of ISS crew member Akihiko Hoshide, KE5DNI, during a Tuesday amateur radio on the International Space Station contact. Responding to a query posed by Graham, KO4FJK, Hoshide said the most interesting things he's seen from space included flying through an aurora and looking down at shooting stars from the ISS. He also said the space station crew was able to view a partial lunar eclipse from space. Another camper, Adam, KD9KIS, wanted to know how often the ISS crew members used the onboard ham station. Hoshide said individual crew members may get on the radio every couple weeks or so, or as the opportunity arises. This ARIS contact is intended to inspire these young hams to learn more about communication using amateur satellites and making ARIS radio contacts, ARIS said in announcing the contact date. ARIS team member John Saigo, ZS6JON in South Africa, served as the Telebridge relay station for the late morning event, which was streamed live via YouTube. Rapp said he's hoping this pilot camp venture will provide the information needed to replicate the camp over multiple locations for years to come. We also hope this brings a more robust community of young hams into amateur radio, he added. The long-anticipated summer camp for up to 30 hams, aged 15 through 25, was set for last June but had to be rescheduled until summer 2021 because of COVID-19 pandemic concerns. The camp for young hams in the Americas took its cue from the summer youngsters on the air camps held for the last few years in various IARU Region 1 countries. The Region 2 camp is aimed at helping participants to take their ham radio experience to the next level by exposing them to a variety of activities and providing the opportunity to meet other young hams. Activities include kit building, antenna building, transmitter hunting, direction finding, operating with digital modes, and launching a high-altitude balloon. Amateur radio satellite operation is one of the workshops provided. Others include effective radio communication, local ham radio history, and using amateur radio during emergencies. The YouTube channel features daily highlight videos. W8Y has been on the air as campers complete projects, between sessions, and during free time, although some late evening slots have been on the schedule. The camp's opening observance on Sunday featured keynote speaker Tim Duffy, K3LR, who told the campers, Amateur radio is the best hobby in the world. Campers also saw a video presentation by International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Youth Working Group Chair, Philip Springer, DK6SP. AWRL and the YASME Foundation donated project kits for the campers. Xtronix provided temperature-controlled soldering stations. The brochure on the Youth on the Air website includes more details about the camp. The next Youngsters on the Air contest is July 18th. Following the success of the first Youngsters on the Air, or Yoda, contest held this past May, the second event is this Sunday, July 18th, from 1000 to 2200 UTC. Organizers say 100 Yoda logs showed up for the inaugural round from operators 25 years old or younger. Including veteran hams, 700 logs were submitted by the deadline. The scores are posted on the Yoda Contest website. Yoda Contests are held three times a year, each lasting just 12 hours, with the ideas of increasing on-the-air activity and awareness of the Yoda program. The contest exchanges operator age, with each age worked counting as a different multiplier. The younger the operator you work, the more points that contact is worth. Email for more information. The June 2021 activity report of the Volunteer Monitor Program has been released. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between the ARRL and the FCC to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. The FCC was requested to review a vanity call sign application filed by a Georgia licensee because of an apparently false answer to a question regarding a felony conviction. A licensee in Massachusetts received an advisory notice concerning obscenity and harassment on 160 meters. The FCC will hold for review any renewal applications filed by this licensee. A general class licensee in San Antonio, Texas, 
received an advisory notice for operation in the extra class portion of the 20 meter band. Licensees in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia, and Virginia received advisory notices concerning failure to identify and other possible violations as part of a general audit of complaints about licensee conduct on 1.938, 3.860, 3.895, and 3.927 megahertz. In May, volunteer monitors logged 1,514 hours on HF frequencies and 2,072 hours on VHF frequencies and above. The volunteer monitor coordinator had one meeting with the FCC and two cases were referred to the FCC for further action. One case involved a taxi company in Alaska operating on two meters. Thanks to volunteer monitor program coordinator Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, for that report. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. Wait for it. My Google's booting up. Why does it do that? I don't know. It's been, re it's been, it's in a boot loop. I'll have to unplug it again. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt, but you know how these things are. These voice assistants, they do interrupt, don't they? You're watching a, game, a TV show, a football game or whatever, and all of a sudden Siri goes, yes, I don't know what you're talking about. Hello? Hello? Please pay attention to me. Or, or Google goes, ah, uh, that's not nice. What? I didn't say anything. Or Amazon's Echo goes, turning all the lights off now, and you're suddenly plunged into the darkness. <laughs> Here's something completely uh, useless. Do you remember the old days of booting your uh, computer? Uh, you put a floppy drive in and it would go, <laughs> and then it, would, it was reading in what we call a master boot record, a little tiny portion of the disk that contained just a few instructions on how to go from here. Go look on the hard drive. There's an operating system there, that kind of thing. Yes, you're a computer. Good morning. Well, somebody, it was crazy. I don't know why they would do this, but somebody has a uh, Boggin Jr., B O G I N J R dot com, has decided that instead of a floppy or a USB or a boot DVD or a hard drive, what if we could boot from a vinyl record? <laughs> Booting from a record player connected a, a, a PC to a record player through an amplifier. On the record, they recorded the sound of a, we call a bootloader. Same thing that's on the master boot record, a small ROM bootloader. It actually requires, in order to do this, you have to have the original IBM PC, which used a, which could boot to a cassette. And that cassette was audio. If you ever, did you ever listen to the cassette? You know, if you can't boot from the floppy, you can't boot from the hard drive. On these IBM PCs, they say, well, I don't know. Is there a cassette? The turntable spins an analog recording of a small, bootable, read-only RAM drive, 64K, containing free DOS, which is a, basically a free version of the old DOS operating system. You know, he had, to, he had to really squeeze it down to get it in there. Command.com. <laughs> Remember that? Command.com. Remember that? The bootloader reads the disk image from the audio recording through the cassette modem, loads it to memory, and boots up. Why would you do that? If you ask, if you have to ask that question, <laughs> I'm curious what this sounds like. Yeah, yeah. There's that uh, uh, trying to get to the uh, the hard drive, and I guess the the turntable's now turning on. And the, it says needle on the record. Oh, it actually has an instruction that says, all right, now, because you have to do this manually, put the needle on the record. <laughs> Start it up. And the record, which says DOS boot disk on it, apparently it's all it needs to play the special sounds. Wait, wait, I don't know. Can you hear that? That's crazy. I shouldn't play that on the air. Because probably somebody somewhere is booting up. <laughs> Sounds a little like that sound that the modems used to make.
The sound of data. That's kind of what this show is about. It's crazy, kooky, wild technology stuff. We also talk about the real world. You know, the uh, Flash. Flash. That's the real world. Not Flash Gordon. Flash, you know, the thing that made those jumping monkeys and the, you know, the punch the monkey and all the animations on the internet for years and years. It's gone, you know. It's over. End of life this year. This is so, so bye-bye, Flash. It's probably a good thing. It was full of bugs. It caused, you know, in endless security problems. It was fat, so it slowed computers down. It, at the beginning of the end was more than a decade ago when Steve Jobs said, we're not going to put Flash in the iPhone. And then later the iPad. We're not going to do it. That was the beginning of the end. Well, if you want to see Flash, you don't need to have Flash in your system, which is good because most systems no longer support it. But you can go to this wonderful place. I hope you know about it called the Internet Archive, where they are saving bits of the Internet, which is a good idea if you think about it in a way. For the last 20 years, much of our history, our conversations, things we were talking about, thinking about doing, happened on websites, on the Internet, right? But they eventually, they go away. People made them, shut them down, give up on them. They become cobwebbed and dusty and eventually disappear. So the Internet Archive has, for that last 20 years, been just kind of scouring the Internet and saving this stuff so that there's a record. It's really a very cool idea. And now they have a f flash showcase where there are more than a thousand flash animations. It, it's kind of fun because they're just out of context. They don't explain themselves. They don't. You can pick them by year, going all the way back to uh, 2000, 20 years ago. You can uh, pick it by subject matter, creator, language, badger, badger. Remember badger, badger? Badger Badger lives on on the Internet Archive. It's archive.org if you're curious. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? First of all, if you're, if you're in Death Valley, uh, stay cool. It was 130 degrees on Friday. Holy cow. And it might happen again today, maybe even tomorrow. It's hot. It's getting hot in here. Hot everywhere. Stay cool. Stay relaxed. Sit by the pool. Get a nice cup of ice water and listen to the Tech Guy show. And I'll try to remain cool, calm, and collected so as not to heat things up. It, that's one of the nice things about talking about tech instead of, say, politics. <laughs> it's, uh, there's, there's not a lot of controversy. It's, pre it's pretty straightforward. Did you watch uh, Richard Branson go up into the edge of space, as they said? The Battle of the Billionaires. He wins the race. It seems a little odd to me. It's like it's I don't get it because what is this? What's historic? I'm sorry. Explain this to me. Alan Shepard did this. When did he do it? 1962. And then we've done other things since then. <laughs> I mean, we were on the moon 50 years ago. You know, they're not. This is just going up 80 kilometers and down in a space plane. So historic, maybe not. Cool. Yeah, sure. It's It was a little uh, battle between billionaire Richard Branson of Virgin and the multi-mega billionaire Jeff Bezos, richest man in the world of formerly of Amazon. He retired as a CEO of Amazon on Monday, a week ago, probably because if he, as the CEO of Amazon, said, hey, by the way, I want a giant rocket uh, strapped to my uh, behind and I'm going <laughs> to go up into space. Is that okay? They would have said, uh, no, you're the CEO. But now he's, you know, he's just the chairman of the board. They can send him up. Funny tweets, though, on Friday. I think I understand. I heard uh, Richard Branson say that Jeff Bezos sent him a, a, a good, good wishes message. So I don't know. But kind of ironically, on Friday, Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos' company, tweeted that basically, <laughs> they, they even did a comparison chart. You know, the kind you see in the computer magazines <laughs> with the check boxes, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, you know, side by side. Flies above the Karman line, internationally recognized boundary of space 100 kilometers. Blue origin? Yes. Galactic? No. Vehicle type? Blue origin? Rocket. Galactic? High altitude airplane. And, and it goes on more like that. 
it's like but he's not even going into space man come on you guys this is unseemly first of all what are you doing here what's the point of all this all right i i don't know it, it, it was cool i don't want to i don't want to rain anybody's parade it was cool that's nice good for you bravo uh, meanwhile, Elon Musk, who could, if he wanted to, could go knock on the door of the space station. I mean, he's got the rocket to do that. Uh, the only of the three billionaires who does. And he's just staying at home, sitting in the hot tub, dreaming his dreams, and making rockets that actually, you know, are doing things. So uh, it's hard for me to get excited about it, okay? I'm just I'm just going to say that and leave it at that. Do you know about the, uh, the Kaseya hack that happened this week? Oh, this is a mess. Kaseya is software used by a lot of IT guys, independent contractor IT guys. They call them MSPs, managed service providers. They're, they're IT guys and gals. And they're, but they're, uh, you know, if you're a small business like ours, like mine, we don't have an IT department. But we have a guy and, uh, who's great and we love him. And he comes over and he Russell and he fixes stuff and things like that. He's an MSP, managed service provider. A lot of these guys use software from a company in Miami called Kaseya. K-A-S-E-Y-A. -E uh, unfortunately, some uh, bad guys got into Kaseya. And by getting into Kaseya, this was a smart move because then they got access to all these IT guys, companies, the little businesses that they run. And it is estimated that between 800 and as many as 1,500 of these companies are now victims of a ransomware attack. You know, a note saying all your, you know, we've got all your data. We've encrypted it. You can't have it unless you give us money. Well, now the other shoe drops, according to Bloomberg yesterday, employ several employees came forward and said, we were, we've been warning Kaseya about this since 2017, and they ignored us. These employees who, this is from Bloomberg, were employed in software engineering and development at Kaseya and asked not to be identified because they feared, retrib feared retribution. They said, hey, hey, boss, uh, this security is terrible. Weak encryption and passwords, a failure to adhere to basic cybersecurity practices like, oh, regularly patching, fixing bugs, and a focus on <clears throat> sales at the expense of other priorities. Yeah, but that's what happens sometimes with these companies. They get, they get you know, all attached to uh, saving money, and, and then look what happens. The Russian-linked criminal gang. By the way, the president called Putin and said, Hey, Vlad, you know, I'm not saying these guys are working for you because I don't know, but can you just knock it off? Can you get him to stop? Oh, sure. No problem. I just call him. The Russian criminal gang called Our Evil demanded $70 million in Bitcoin for the decryptor for all of this. And really, there's no excuse for it. There's <laughs> really... No excuse for it. They were a sitting duck. And I, I'm sorry for any MSPs that were using Kaseya because now your reputation is shot. <sighs> this is going to be the year of ransomware. I said that last year. I said the year before. Every year it's worse. Every year it's worse. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip? into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. In 1932, the United States was trapped in the Great Depression. The gross national product had fallen by 50%, and unemployment was 25%. Despite the bleak economic forecast, or, maybe because of it, amateur radio was flourishing, with a 300% increase in the number of hams over a five-year period. It was during this time frame that two of the best-known names in amateur radio receivers, Hallicrafters and Hammerland, came into existence. In our last installment, we charted the rise and fall of Hallicrafters. Today, let's look at Hammerland. Oscar Hammerland founded the company that bears his name in 1932. His goal was to produce top-of-the-line receivers for amateur, military, and commercial use. By all accounts, he was successful. The first model was the Comet Super Pro. By the late 1930s, Hammerland introduced the HQ-120X, 
This was a 12-tube, six-band, single conversion receiver that covered 540 kilocycles to 31 megacycles. The price in 1938 was $129. With inflation, that's about $900 today. In 1939, the company created the Super Pro model SP200, considered by many to be Hammerlin's finest pre-war receiver. Hammerlin's motto was, use the set the experts use. The SP200 featured 16 tubes in the receiver, two tubes in the separate power supply, and sold for $279, or about $2,000 today. During World War II, the military, the U.S. Signal Corps, and many governmental agencies extensively used the SP200. After the war, Hammerlin introduced the HQ-129X, which was an updated and improved version of the HQ-120X. Incidentally, the X indicated that the receiver had a crystal filter. Other post-war single conversion receivers included the HQ-140 and the HQ-150. In the Super Pro series, Hammerlin's first post-war model was the SP-210, but it was the SP-600 introduced in 1950 that got everyone's attention. This was a large, solid, and expensive receiver. It contained 20 vacuum tubes, covered 540 kilocycles to 54 megacycles in six bands, weighed 100 pounds, and consumed 180 watts of power. The price in 1950 was $985, almost $5,000 today. A very low frequency version, the SP600 VLF, sold for more than $2,000 in 1950, $300 more than a new Studebaker. The SP600 series was produced in a variety of models until 1972 and was used extensively by the military, the FBI, the CIA, and other government and commercial organizations. The SP600 was not designed with amateur radio in mind. That, along with a price equal to the annual net income of a typical ham, kept it from being a popular amateur receiver. Although the bulk of Hammerlin's output was general coverage receivers, they also produced ham band only units, such as the HQ-110, a 12-tube unit made from 1957 to 1961, and the HQ-170, a 16-tube receiver produced from 1958 to 1968. The HQ-170 covered 160 through 6 meters and was triple conversion with IFs of 3035, 455, and 60 kilocycles. Hammerlin's last major receiver was the HQ-180, introduced in 1959. This was a very popular general coverage receiver covering 540 kilocycles to 30 megacycles. It had 17 tubes, a triple conversion design, and sold for $439 in 1959. During the 1950s and 1960s, Hammerlin went through some changes. They moved to Mars Hill, North Carolina, and tried to expand their product line beyond just receivers. They came out with some transmitters, called the HX series, and even ventured into the CB radio market with the CB23, HQ105TR, and the HQ205. The last two units were unique in the CB radio arena as they had a built-in shortwave receiver in addition to the CB transmitter. Unfortunately, the HX series and the CB radios were not successful and by 1969, they disappeared. By the late 1960s, Hammerland was in trouble. Their main product was the HQ-180 and its various military and commercial derivatives. Except for the HQ-215, an all-solid-state receiver, the company ignored transistors. Hams no longer looked for tube-type receivers. They wanted transceivers and, by the early 1970s, solid-state 2-meter FM rigs. Even in the shrinking receiver-only market, Hammerlin faced stiff competition from Heathkit, Halicrafters, Lafayette, National, Nightkit, and Allied Radio Shack, all of whom had four or five tube shortwave radios for less than $70. The 
The cheapest receiver Hammerland ever sold had eight tubes and cost twice as much. During the early 1970s, Hammerland tried one last PR blitz with friendly, folksy ads in QST, but it was hopeless. Why should the 1972 amateur spend $400 or more for a receiver when $350 bought a Tempo 1 transceiver? The writing was on the wall. Even National and Halicrafters with wider product lines were on their last legs. And so, in 1972, Hammerlin pulled the plug on the HQ-180 and the SP-600 and closed up shop. The corporate assets, including the name and trademarks, were purchased by the Cardwell Capacitor Company, who also purchased the remains of National at a bankruptcy auction. But even though the company is gone, the indestructible receivers still live on. Today, thousands of enthusiasts rediscover the romance and excitement of shortwave listening with the warm, comforting glow of a Hammerlin receiver. In this day and age of scanners and other pre-programmed receivers, have we lost the art of trolling the HF frequencies for that rare and unique catch? Perhaps we need more Hammerlin receivers in the hands of amateurs. Direct from our newsroom in Washington, in color, this is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Legendary CBS newsman Walter Cronkite, KB2GSD, who held the title of Most Trusted Man in America, passed away Friday, July 17th after a long illness. He was 92. The avuncular Cronkite anchored CBS Evening News for 19 years until 1981 when he retired. During that time, he reported on such subjects as the Kennedy assassination, the civil rights movement, Apollo 11, Vietnam and Vietnam-era protests, the Arab-Israeli Six-Day War, Watergate, and the Menachem Begin peace accords. From 1962 to 1981, Mr. Cronkite was a nightly presence in American homes and always a reassuring one guiding viewers through national triumphs and tragedies alike, from moonwalks to war in an era when network news was central to many people's lives. He became something of a national institution with an unflappable delivery, a distinctively avuncular voice and a daily benediction, and that's the way it is. He was Uncle Walter to many, respected, liked, and listened to. With his trimmed mustache and calm manner, he even bore a resemblance to another trusted American fixture, another Walter, Walt Disney. Along with Chet Huntley and David Brinkley on NBC, Mr. Cronkite was among the first celebrity anchormen. Cronkite, an ARRL member, narrated the six-minute video Amateur Radio Today, produced by the League in 2003. The video tells Amateur Radio's public service story to non-hams, focusing on ham radio's part in helping various agencies respond to wildfires in the western U.S. during 2002, ham radio in space, and the role amateur radio plays in emergency communications. Dozens of radio amateurs help the police in fire departments and other emergency services maintain communications in New York, Pennsylvania, and Washington, D.C., narrator Cronkite intoned in reference to Ham Radio's response on September 11, 2001. Their country, he said, asked, and they responded without reservation. Walter Leland Cronkite was born in St. Joseph, Missouri on November 4, 1916, the only child of a dentist father and a homemaker mother. When he was still young, his family moved to Texas. One day, his CBS obituary reads, he read an article in Boy's Life about the adventures of reporters working around the world, and young Cronkite was hooked. He began working on his high school newspaper and yearbook, and in 1933, he entered the University of Austin, Texas, to study political science, economics, and journalism. He never graduated. He took a part-time job at the Houston Post and left college to do what he loved, report. For more on KB2GST's professional career, we go to our own Steve Batten, W4XQ. Steve? Thank you, Scott. When he was 16, Mr. Cronkite went with friends to Chicago for the 1933 World's Fair. He volunteered to help demonstrate an experimental version of television. I could honestly say to all my colleagues, I was in television long before you were, he said in an interview with CBS News in 1996. Mr. Cronkite attended the University of Texas for two years, studying political science, economics, and journalism. 
working on the school newspaper and picking up journalism jobs with the Houston Press and other newspapers. He also auditioned to be an announcer at an Austin radio station but was turned down. He left college in 1935 without graduating to take a job as a reporter with the press. While visiting Kansas City, Missouri, he was hired by the radio station KCMO to read news and broadcast football games under the name Walter Wilcox. At KCMO, Mr. Cronkite met an advertising writer named Mary Elizabeth Maxwell. The two read a commercial together. One of Mr. Cronkite's lines was, You look like an angel. They were married for 64 years until her death in 2005. After being fired from KCMO in a dispute over journalism practices he considered shabby, Mr. Cronkite, in 1939, landed a job at the United Press News Agency, now United Press International. He reported from Houston, Dallas, El Paso, and Kansas City. The stint ended when he briefly returned to radio and then took a job with Braniff International Airways in Kansas City, selling tickets and doing public relations. Returning to United Press after a few months, he became one of the first reporters accredited to American forces with the outbreak of World War II. He gained fame as a war correspondent, crash landing a glider in Belgium, accompanying the first Allied troops into North Africa, reporting on the Normandy invasion, and covering major battles, including the Battle of the Bulge in 1944. In 1943, Edward R. Murrow asked Mr. Cronkite to join his wartime broadcast team in CBS's Moscow Bureau. In The Murrow Boys, Pioneers on the Front Lines of Broadcast Journalism, 1996, Stanley Cloud and Lynn Olson wrote that Murrow was astounded when Mr. Cronkite rejected his $125 a week job offer and decided to stay with the United Press for $92 a week. That year, Mr. Cronkite was one of eight journalists selected for an Army Air Forces training program that took them on a bombing mission to Germany aboard B-17 Flying Fortresses. Cronkite made his mark as a World War II correspondent for United Press where he covered the D-Day invasion and bombing missions over Germany. After the war, he served as UP's chief correspondent at the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials and spent two years in Moscow. He joined CBS in 1950 as a Washington correspondent. He distinguished himself with his coverage of the 1952 and 1956 political conventions and as narrator of the documentary series, The 20th Century. In 1962, he was named anchor of the CBS Evening News, then 15 minutes in length. The following year, it became Network TV's first 30-minute weeknight newscast. Cronkite's nightly sign-off, and that's the way it is, became part of the popular lexicon, his gravelly voice instantly recognizable. At the time, the CBS Evening News lived in the long shadow cast by NBC's Huntley Brinkley Report, the most popular television newscast in the country. Expectations for the Cronkite newscast were not high, the CBS obituary said, but in 1963 the broadcast was expanded to 30 minutes and Cronkite won a title for which he had long campaigned, managing editor. The added time gave the broadcast more depth and variety and the title gave Cronkite more influence over the content and coverage. And it came at a significant time. In September of that year, Cronkite launched the expanded program with an extended interview with President John F. Kennedy. Two months later, it was Cronkite who broke into the soap opera, As the World Turns, to announce that the president had been shot, and later to declare that he had been killed. CBS called it a defining moment for Cronkite and for the country. His presence, in shirt sleeves, slowly removing his glasses to check the time and blink back tears, captured both the sense of shock and the struggle for composure that would consume America and the world over the next four days. One of Cronkite's enthusiasms was the space race. In 1969, when America sent a man to the moon, he couldn't contain himself. Go, baby, go, he said as Apollo 11 took off. He ended up performing what critics described as Walter-to-Walter -Walter coverage of the mission, staying on the air for 27 of the 30 hours that Apollo 11 took to complete its mission. In 1977, Cronkite interviewed Egyptian President Anwar el-Sadat, who, according to CBS, told Cronkite that, if invited, he'd go to Jerusalem to meet with Prime Minister Menachem Begin. The move was unprecedented. The next day, Begin invited Sadat to Jerusalem 
for talks that eventually led to the Camp David Accords and the Israeli-Egyptian Treaty. In 1981, Cronkite announced he would retire at the age of 65 to make way for a new anchor in the chair, Dan Rather, CBS said. A commentator said it was like George Washington leaving the dollar bill. Cronkite said on March 6, 1981, as he concluded his final broadcast as Anchorman, old anchormen, you see, don't fade away. They just keep coming back for more. And that's the way it is. After leaving the evening news broadcast, Cronkite was seen and heard occasionally as a special correspondent for CBS, CNN, and NPR. From 1987 to 1992, he filled his last role for CBS News. Walter Cronkite's 20th Century, a 90-second radio segment for CBS Radio. A production company he co-founded in 1993, the Cronkite Ward Company, produced documentaries for the Discovery Channel, PBS, and other networks. In 2004, he wrote a weekly syndicated newspaper column that appeared in 186 newspapers. For many years, Cronkite hosted the annual Vienna New Year's Concert on PBS and the Kennedy Center Honors. In 2000, Cronkite was designated a living legend by the Library of Congress. Established during its bicentennial celebration in 2000, the Library of Congress's Living Legend Award is selected by the library's curators and subject specialists to honor artists, writers, activists, filmmakers, physicians, entertainers, sports figures, and public servants who have made significant contributions to America's diverse cultural, scientific, and social heritage. The professional accomplishments of the living legends have enabled them to provide examples of personal excellence that have benefited others and enriched the nation in a variety of ways. For a look at Walter Cronkite's amateur radio career as KB2GSD, we go to our own Frank Haas, KB4T. Steve Mendelson, W2ML, was Cronkite's radio engineer at CBS for many years. I had many chances to discuss my favorite hobby, ham radio, with the world's most trusted anchorman, he told the ERRL. Gradually, his interest increased, but on finding that he had to pass a Morse code test, he balked, saying it was too hard for him. However, he told me that he had purchased a receiver and listened every night for a few minutes to the novice bands. At the CBS radio network, Walter would arrive 10 minutes before we went on the air to read his script aloud, make corrections for his style of grammar, and just get in the mood to do the show. In those days, Rich Mosin, W2VU, was the producer of a show called In the News, a three-minute television show for children voiced by CBS correspondent Christopher Glenn. On this day, Rich was at the broadcast center to record Chris's voice for his show and had dropped by my control room to discuss some upcoming ARRL issues. Mendelssohn was ARRL Hudson Division Director at the time. When Walter walked into the studio, I started to set up the show at the behest of our director, Dick Muller, WA2DOS. In setting up the tape recorders, I had to send tone to them and make sure they were all at proper level. Having some time, I grabbed the New York Times and started sending code with the tone key on the audio console. For 10 minutes, I sent code and noticed Walter had turned his script over and was copying it. We went to air as we did every day at 4.50 p.m. And after we were off, Walter brought his script into the control room. Neatly printed on the back was the text I had sent with the tone key. Rich and I looked at the copy. He nodded, and I told Walter that he had just passed the code test. He laughed and asked when the formal test was going to be. But I reminded him that it took two general class licensees to validate the test, and he had just passed the code. Several weeks later, he passed the written test, and the FCC issued KB2GSD, to the most trusted anchorman in America. Having passed the license test, Walter was now ready to get on the air. His first QSO was on 10 meters, about 28.390 megahertz. He was nervous, and I called him on the phone to talk him through his first experience. As we talked on the air, a ham from the Midwest came on and called me. 
Acknowledging him, I asked the usual questions about where he was from, wanting to give Walter a bit of flavor of what the hobby was about. Turning it over to Walter, and following his introduction, the gentleman in the Midwest said, That's the worst Walter Cronkite imitation I've ever heard. I suggested that maybe it was Walter, and the man replied, Walter Cronkite is not even a ham, and if he was, he certainly wouldn't be here on 10 meters. Walter and I laughed for weeks at that one. In 2007, the Radio Club of America, or RCA, presented Cronkite with the Armstrong Award, the RCA's foremost achievement award, and named for its first recipient, Major Edwin Armstrong. Upon presenting the award to the esteemed newsman, Richard Summers, W6NSV, said, Each year, the Radio Club of America recognizes outstanding achievement in the field of wireless communications by honoring individuals who have made significant contributions to the industry and the public it serves. The highest and most prestigious award given by the club is the Armstrong Medal created in 1935 and named after Major Edwin Armstrong, wireless pioneer and inventor of FM radio. Since that time, this award has been presented infrequently and only to those most accomplished and deserving individuals, those who have made important contributions to the radio art and science. As his significant contribution, our award recipient has used the medium of television to keep the American public informed of the news in a manner never before imagined. And tonight, we have the distinct privilege of having that individual with us, America's best-known and most respected broadcast journalist, Walter Cronkite. When Summers was done with his speech, Cronkite stepped up to the podium, and Summers handed him the award. Cronkite simply said, Thank you for accepting me as one of you, and for your accomplishments in the field of communications. Before the RCA banquet and ceremony, ARRL Hudson Division Director Frank Fallon, N2FF, presented Cronkite with the ARRL President's Award. This award, created in 2003 by the ARRL Board of Directors, recognizes an ARRL member or members who have shown long-term dedication to the goals and objectives of ARRL and amateur radio, and who have gone the extra mile to support individual league programs and goals. Cronkite was selected to receive the award in April 2005 in recognition of his outstanding support of the ARRL and amateur radio by narrating the videos Amateur Radio Today and The ARRL Goes to Washington. It was quite a thrill to make this presentation to Cronkite, Fallon said. He has long been recognized as the most trusted man in America. Aligning our causes to his face, name, and voice has been a great help. Mendelssohn remembered Cronkite as a wonderful friend with a great sense of humor. On one particular day, I was a bit withdrawn and missed several cues on the radio show. After the show, Walter came into the control room and asked our director, Dick Muller, WA2DOS, what was wrong. Dick explained that my dad had just had an operation and that I was quite worried as my father was in his late 60s. Later that night, I went to visit my father in the hospital, and when I arrived, all he would talk about was how thrilled he was talking with Walter Cronkite on the phone for a half hour before I arrived. I was stunned, as I had not told anyone but the director about the operation. I found out the next day that Walter had asked his secretary to call all of the hospitals on Long Island to find my dad and talk with him, and even though I saw Walter in the hallway after work, he never told me he had talked with my dad. This was the measure of the man, never too busy to help someone he worked with. To me, Walter was always a friend, not just the most trusted anchorman in America. Cronkite is the recipient of a Peabody Award, the William White Award for Journalistic Merit, an Emmy Award from the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, the George Polk Journalism Award, and a gold medal from the International Radio and Television Society. 
In 1981, during his final three months on the CBS Evening News, Cronkite received 11 major awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom. In 1985, he became the second newsman after Edward R. Murrow to be selected for the Television Hall of Fame. In 2006, Cronkite was asked in an interview with Gail Schister if he ever thought about death. When you get to be 89, he said, you have to think about it a little bit. It doesn't prey on me, and it doesn't keep me awake nights. Occasionally, when I'm upset about something else, I think, my gosh, I don't know if I should do this or that, because I'm not sure I'll be here that long to enjoy it. Mr. Cronkite is survived by his daughters, Nancy Elizabeth and Mary Kathleen, his son Walter Leland III, and four grandsons. And that's the way it is. Thursday, March 17th, 1977. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News. Good night. Time now for the AMSAT report. AMS have built some satellites that have lived well into old age. There's AO7, of course. Launched in November 1974, long before many users were born and still semi-operational. PCSAT NO44 is also semi-operational after 20 years in space. Launched in 2001 from the Kodiak Island Launch Complex, battery issues made it necessary to reset the satellite three times a year. NO44's mission was declared at an end on April 26, 2003 and dead on July 17th, although that may have been a little bit premature. Since then, numerous attempts have been made to totally recover the satellite, but that effort has stopped. NO44 remains on and active when conditions are favorable for sunlight, usually during midday passes, although by the time it covers about 30 to 45 minutes into eclipse, the power drops. Listen for it on 145.825. Hats off to Bob Berninger, WB4APR, and his then crew of U.S. Naval Academy shipmen. The AMSAT Report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. A recent report on spaceweather.com tells us of an event on the sun that surprised a lot of space scientists with its ferocity, and it all points to a developing solar cycle 25. Bring it on! Something just exploded on the far side of the sun. The blast was so potent, it peppered Earth with energetic particles, even though the body of the sun itself was blocking the blast site. This is the latest sign of increasing activity by young Solar Cycle 25. Spaceweather.com reports that this event happened on July the 13th. The debris from the explosion emerged in a circular cloud known as a halo coronal mass ejection. When space weather forecasters first saw this explosion, there was a moment of excitement. It appeared to be heading directly towards Earth. However, data from NASA's Stereo A spacecraft indicated otherwise. The ejection was heading directly away from us, so it was classed as a far side event. But although the explosion occurred on the far side, separated from Earth by the massive body of the Sun itself, it still peppered our planet with high energy particles. Detailed analysis is still being carried out, but it is speculated that the liftoff of the coronal mass ejection was so violent it may have created a global shockwave on the Sun, with the possibility of some particles spilling over the edge and they might have spiralled towards Earth. In its report, spaceweather.com says that the source of the blast might have been the same sunspot group, AR2838, that produced the first X-ray flare of Solar Cycle 25 on July the 3rd. That sunspot is currently transiting the far side of the Sun, approximately where the coronal mass ejection came from. Within the next week, this sunspot group is expected to return to an Earth-facing position, and then maybe the real fun will begin. So keep your eyes on the spaceweather.com website. If operating via satellite is as easy for you as stepping outside and pointing your antenna skyward to catch a pass, consider what hams in Switzerland are now required to do. They must pay a fee to access satellites. With more details on this story, we go to Steve Richards, G4NJH. Reporting from the Southgate Amateur Radio News. 
As radio hams, we should never take our access to the spectrum for granted. It's a gift to be given or taken away, and each country's governments have their own special grip on what they will and won't allow within their borders. And most of the time, radio amateurs don't have to pay for using this one precious spectrum. Well, I did say most of the time. If you're an amateur radio satellite user, count yourself lucky that you don't live in Switzerland. The Swiss communications regulator, Ofcom, charges £55 or 70 Swiss francs to issue radio amateurs with special permits to use the QO100 amateur satellite transponders. The Swiss National Amateur Radio Society, the Union of Swiss Shortwave Amateurs, or the USKA, said that the regulator wishes to protect license-exempt users in the 2.4 GHz band, and Ofcom reserves the right to withdraw the special permit if there are problems. The special permit entitles the holder to use a transmitter with a maximum output power of 100 watts PEP for a satellite uplink in the range 2400 to 2410 MHz. As part of their application, radio amateurs must submit the following information, their call sign and license number, location details including Swiss mapping coordinates, details of their antenna including gain, height above the ground, direction and elevation, and they must also provide an email address and a telephone number so that the operator can be reached while the system is in operation. Well, there's more at tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Switzerland. The regulator is charging 60 Swiss francs, the equivalent of about 76 US dollars. HAMS applications must contain all relevant information, including their location, so the regulator can keep track of all Swiss radio operators making use of the transponder on board the satellite. Transmitters are limited to a maximum output of 100 watts PEP on the satellite uplink in the frequency range between 2.4 and 2.41 gigahertz. Ofcom's biggest concern is the potential for interference in the 2.4 GHz band, which may be used license-free for industrial, scientific, and medical purposes. The third QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is a month away. The live event takes place over the August 14th and 15th weekend, and presentations will remain available on demand for 30 days. Sponsors predict that the event will be a great experience for those wanting to improve their knowledge of amateur radio, as well as of cutting-edge ham radio technology and practical techniques. The ARRL is a QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo partner. At the Expo, you can listen and engage with almost 100 internationally recognized ham radio luminaries on approximately 18 different tracked topic areas. There is something for everyone, the sponsors say. Topics include antennas and transmission lines, build-a-thons, contesting and DX, controllers, digital voice mode, emergency communications, filters and tuned circuits, the future of amateur radio, ham history, HF digital modes, new licenses, power amps, propagation, radio astronomy, software and services, space and satellites, test and measurement, and youth and amateur radio. A complete list of speakers at the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is posted on the event's website. These are some examples. In the Antennas and Transmission Lines presentation, August Hansen, KB0YH, will focus on such topics as Small Transmitting Loop Design and STL Calc, an open source design aid for STL and magnetic loop antennas that can respond to users' changing needs and design goals. Jeffrey Mendenhall, W8GNM, will address the topic Compromised Beverage Antennas Hear Better Than You Think. The presentation focuses on overcoming non-ideal terrain and space limitations. Fun with HF QRP Pedestrian Mobile with Peter Parker, VK3YE, will offer a look at two antennas for HF Pedestrian Mobile and the results possible with such an operation. Ham Radio author Don Keith, N4KC, will present Top 5 Get on the Air Quick Antennas, which offers recommendations for the simplest, most effective antennas to consider. Within the new license, Now What Track, the presentation HF Noise Mitigation will describe various noise sources and how to mitigate noise using a variety of techniques. Anthony Luscree, K8ZT, will discuss technician licensees, life beyond local repeaters. Participants will explore the world of activities, modes, and bands available outside of repeater operation. There's no limit on the number of topics and tracks that QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo visitors may view. Return anytime within 30 days to review any presentation, as well as to explore exhibitor offerings. Early bird tickets are $10 or $12.50 at the door. Access to only the exhibitor area is free.
Switzerland's National Amateur Radio Society, the USKA, recently took action to tackle a case of repeater abuse. Their UHF group reports that on the morning of July the 2nd, 2021, various 70 centimeter repeaters suffered serious interference in the form of DTMF tones and siren signals. And this was not for the first time either. Various direction-finding teams were encouraged to track down the troublemaker, and they were successful. Various bearings led to an area southeast of Menzingen, where at 12.30pm, two teams found a radio amateur who was already known to the authorities. Two of the team then had what was described as intensive conversations with the troublemaker, who, as in a previous confrontation with the tracking team in May, pretended to be stupid and clueless. But due to the unarguable bearing results, and the fact that the team had already challenged the same person at the same bearing coordinates, there was no doubt that they'd found the culprit. The UHF group said that they hoped that the interferer's intelligence was just sufficient to see that it was now time for him to be shut down. The UKSA expressed their thanks to all those who'd supported them over the many weeks and months with their tips, active help and thousands of kilometres driven. In the end, they said, ham spirit is what you achieve together. The UKSA UHF group is responsible for planning, installing and operating 70 centimetre and 23 centimetre repeaters in Switzerland. Their website is at www.hb9uf.ch. Foundations of Amateur Radio For much of the past month, I've been attempting to articulate what open source software is, why it's important, how it's relevant to our hobby, how it works, how software is different from hardware, and why you should consider if the equipment you buy comes with source code or not. I'm finding it difficult to separate out the issues since they all hang together in a cohesive clump of ideas and concepts. So, let me go sideways to set the scene. There is a movement that asserts the right to repair our own things and to ensure that manuals and diagnostic tools used by manufacturers are made available to the public. For many radio amateurs that might sound quaint and obvious, since for much of the hobby that kind of information was not only available, it was expected and assumed to be available. You can get the circuit diagram and testing procedures, the alignment process and the list of required test equipment for most, if not all, amateur transceivers today. And truth be told, if that testing gear isn't available, we tend to build or scrounge our own. Compare a Yaesu FT-857D and an ICOM IC-7300. Their radios from different generations use different technologies, are made by different manufacturers and come in different packaging. Both radios have user manuals, circuit diagrams and documented testing and alignment processes, but they're not equivalent, even if they look the same. The 857 is constructed from discrete components and circuits. There's a microprocessor on board, the source code is not available, and updates are issued by the manufacturer if and when it sees fit. Its function is to control and sequence things, selecting band filters, switching modes, updating the display and control serial communications. While integral to the functioning of the radio, the microprocessor itself is used for command and control only. Inside the 7300, you'll also find discrete components. There are circuits, filters and the like, and while individual components have reduced in size, there are many of the same kinds of functions inside the radio as you'll find on an 857. The microprocessor inside the 7300 is more advanced than the one inside the 857. The source code is also not available and updates are issued by the manufacturer when it sees fit. If that was all there was to it, I would not have spent a month attempting to capture this. Suffice to say that looks are deceiving. The microprocessor inside the 7300 does the exact same things as the 857 with one minor difference. It now also forms part of the signal input and output chain of the radio itself. Let me say that again. The computer that is the heart of a modern radio is an integral part of the signal processing of the radio. Where in a traditional radio the microprocessor was switching circuits on and off to process the signal, the modern solution is to do all the signal processing using software inside the microprocessor itself. If you want to get technical, an FPGA is doing much of the signal processing, but that too is driven by software. Where previously you had access to the circuit diagram that would show you what was being done to the signal, 
Today, you have a magic black box that does stuff completely outside your control. If you want to know how an SSB or FM signal is decoded on the 857, the service manual will helpfully point you at two chips, which provide those specific functions. It describes how the signal comes into the chip and how the signal is processed once it leaves the chip, and if you need more, you can look online to find the specifications for each chip to see precisely what they do and how they work, complete with equivalent circuits and specifications. On the other hand, if you wanted to know the same information for the 7300, you'd be out of luck, because if you dig deep enough, following the signal path, eventually you'd end up inside the microprocessor, where software is making that happen. There's no description on how this works, what the circuit equivalent characteristics are, there's no way to change how it works, no way to set parameters, no way to see inside, and no way to experiment. This is a problem because it means that you've got a solution that's no longer operating in the spirit of amateur radio. It's not open for experimentation, it's not subject to review, there's no way to test, no means to improve, no way to do anything other than what the manufacturer decided was appropriate. For example, if I wanted to modify the FM pass bandwidth on an 857, I could update the FM demodulation circuit by replacing a couple of components. On a 7300, I could not, because there is no circuit. The FM demodulator is described in software that I don't have access to, and ICOM has decided that the FM pass band is fixed. If the software was open, however, I could add this function and make it available to anyone who would like to experiment. At this point, I'd also like to observe that the ICOM user manual states that inside the IC7300, it uses open source CMSIS RTOS RTX, Zlib, and LibPNG software. So ICOM is benefiting from open source efforts, but not sharing their own. This is not an ICOM only problem. This is a specific issue around open source versus closed source. And while you might think that the right to repair an open source is something that's not relevant to you, I'd like to invite you to consider what the implications are for our hobby. Are we going to go down the road of button pushers, or are we continuing our role as inventors and experimenters? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. YouTuber Rob Braxman calls himself the Internet Security Man. He's also a radio amateur. In a recent video release, Rob talks about the many domestic devices which are using radio frequencies to move data around and says that your personal internet devices are secretly communicating with each other. This includes your devices that are not just in your home. To be clear, Rob runs a company which wants to sell you security products, but the video is worth watching as it does illuminate what might be going on with the equipment in your home, and he uses his experience of amateur radio to provide an introduction to how these devices use the radio spectrum. In the video, he asks whether domestic consumers are aware that their internet-connected devices may be transmitting to third parties. For example, he says, did you know that your TV may have the capability and may currently be transmitting your activity far and wide? Rob talks about what he calls secret communications occurring between internet-connected devices using protocols like Bluetooth LE, Zigbee, Thread, 802.15 and LoRa. He says that domestic consumers are unlikely to know about this or didn't have it explained when they bought these devices. Just like Amazon Echo has been conscripted to work with the Amazon Sidewalk Mesh network, other networks are in operation and some are completely unknown. You can learn about these in Rob Braxman's video. And can you jam these devices? Well, this is answered at the end of the video. Rob's company produces several transceiver development kits that techie people can use to play with radio frequencies and see what's really going on. If you want to view the presentation, go to YouTube and then search for Rob Braxman Tech Radios Built In. With a population just north of 71,000, the Caribbean island country of Dominica boasts a modest but active ham radio population. Given Dominica's vulnerability to hurricanes, the ham radio emphasis often focuses on emergency communication support. In 2017, after Hurricane Maria hit the tiny island, ham radio filled a huge telecommunications gap. Now the country's telecommunications regulator is asking hams to help formulate new amateur radio guidelines and standards. 
Dominica's National Telecommunications Regulatory Commission, or NTRC, collected comments until July 12th from radio amateurs participating in a consultation, or what the US FCC would call a proceeding, that could lead to a formal and better documented set of rules and regulations. There is limited guidance for those who seek to utilize the telecommunications media for their own personal use, enjoyment, and fulfillment as a hobby, as in the case of amateur radio, the NTRC said in a consultation document. Generally, amateur radio is self-regulating, and so the involvement of the telecommunications regulator is minimized. Though amateur radio clubs generally do their best to provide some level of guidance and support to existing and prospective operators, there is great need for a formal and comprehensive set of guidelines and standards for the operation of amateur radio services in Dominica. Resources used in developing the draft proposals included ARRL, the FCC's Part 97 Amateur Radio Rules, and the International Telecommunication Union. A primary source for this document was the Code of Federal Regulations due to its comprehensiveness and its informal adoption in certain parts by the local amateur radio fraternity, the NTRC said. Specific ARRL resources included the ARRL FCC rulebook, the ARRL Operating Manual for Radio Amateurs, and the ARRL Handbook for Radio Communications. The regulators also looked at Canada's and Australia's amateur radio rules. The proposals would provide for three license classes, novice, general, and advanced, as well as the licensing procedures for each. The NTRC held a public meeting via Zoom in mid-June to highlight and clarify important issues regarding the consultation. NTRC personnel later met with amateur radio club representatives at the NTRC's office. Under Telecommunications Act No. 8 of 2000 and its associated regulations, the NTRC oversees compliance with all telecommunication rules in Dominica, including amateur radio. The NTRC also manages amateur radio spectrum. Following the initial comment period, the NTRC will review the comments and subsequently submit the revised draft Amateur Radio Guidelines and Standards document for the comments on the initial comments received. The NTRC will also review these comments and finalize the policy document, taking all views into consideration to adopt and publish the Amateur Radio Guidelines and Standards document. Brian J. McChesney K1LI stroke J7Y, a frequent visitor to Dominica, has provided considerable guidance and assistance to the amateur radio community in Dominica, especially in the area of emergency and disaster communication. He characterized the NTRC proposals as a comprehensive documentation of the common sense practices that have traditionally been followed with some notable additions. Set for the 21st and 22nd of August, the 24th Annual International Lighthouse and Lightship Weekend will be back, despite the disruption caused by the global COVID-19 pandemic. Each year, typically on the third weekend of August, participants set up portable stations at or near lighthouses and lightships around the world. Last year, prospects for the event were looking dim, but regular supporters wanted the event to be a beacon of hope and more than 360 registrations from 43 countries backed up that belief. As of the 8th of July, this year's registration tally has already topped 211, with 29 participants from Australia, 25 from the United Kingdom, 51 from Germany, 23 from the USA and 6 from South Africa. The International Lighthouse and Lightship Weekend typically attracts entries from some 500 lighthouses in over 40 countries. The event has few rules and is not a typical contest type event. The activity will begin at 0001 UTC on the 21st of August and continue through to 2359 UTC on the 22nd of August. 
Each station's operators decide how they will operate their station regarding modes and bands. There's no power restrictions or entry classes and no scores. In their announcement, the event organizers said that they wish operators to enjoy themselves and have fun whilst contacting as many amateur radio stations as possible. They request that stations take time to work other lighthouses or lightships, as well as the slow morse operators or the newly licensed or low power stations. Participants should contact the relevant authorities to get permission to operate. It is within the guidelines of the event to move operations from a lighthouse to a museum for historic reasons. In any case, the lighthouse should be visible to and visited by the public wherever possible. You can visit the event website for more information. It's at illw.net. Although he never held an amateur radio license, the late American comedian Red Skelton was quite a ham. Fans of his TV, stage and film antics will attest to that. A special event station recently honored this Indiana native across the HF bands. Getting on the air to mark the 108th birthday of the late Red Skelton, special event station K9R exceeded its organizers' expectations. Operators called QRZ for nearly two weeks to end on Sunday, July 18th, and by the latest count, the log was fast approaching more than 700 QSOs, both DX and domestic. The QRZ page was getting more than 400 hits per day. Organizer Mark Stephen Williams, K9GX, said this first-time activation was designed to coincide with a festival being held by the Red Skelton Museum of American Comedy in the comedian's hometown of Vincennes, Indiana. The museum is showcasing an exhibit called Airwave Anniversaries, spotlighting broadcast high points of his career. Mark said that when he spoke to the museum's director, Ann Pratt, about a possible activation, they both agreed the exhibit and festival paired naturally with the special event. The K2R organizers said that while waiting to receive their QSL cards, hams who made contact are invited to upload pictures of themselves and their shacks to the Facebook page of the Red Skelton Museum of American Comedy. To celebrate the first anniversary of the international group The Slow Morse Club, three special call signs will be active between July the 17th and the 25th. There will be Tango Mike 1, Sierra Mike Charlie, operated by Jeff F4IIQ from France, GB1 Sierra Mike Charlie, operated by Ray G0OKR for England, and Echo India 1 Sierra Mike Charlie, operated by John EI3HQB and Keith ei 5 KJ from Ireland. This group aims to encourage new operators and shortwave listeners to learn Morse code, but also to bring together those who enjoy CW at a more relaxing pace. The group already enjoys more than 1,800 members around the world. The slow Morse stations will be active on the bands between 80 and 2 meters on CW and single sideband. A special paper QSL card will be sent out via the Bureau to each station present in the log and to the shortwave listeners who request it. Please send your QSL and SWL reports to the relevant QSL manager for each call sign. You can consult qrz.com for more information about the event. You can also find the Slow Morse Club on Facebook. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Every year, professional and amateur tower climbers fall to their deaths. In most cases, these accidents were avoidable. Not too long ago, people in my community were shocked when a commercial tower climber fell to his death. According to our local paper, Jerry Trammell, 29 years old, not an amateur, of southern Indiana fell from an older style microwave reflector tower where he was working with another climber they were painting the tower there is no way to prevent all accidents that's why they call them accidents as a tower climber we can reduce them by following some simple safety guidelines no matter if you're climbing up or down a simple climbing procedure can dramatically reduce the risk of falling the cost for this added safety is a slower rate of climb first off Use the proper commercial climbing belt and attachment gear. Secondly, always wear a commercial climbing shoulder harness. Join the harness to your belt. And lastly, use a similar strap from your harness and attach it to the tower. 
but always to a different placement on the tower from your belt. This way, no matter which one fails, the other one is more than strong enough to hold your weight and that of your gear and cargo. With a dual strap attachment, you can climb up or down with two straps and always be attached to the tower. Using this method, the only thing that can injure you is a total failure of the tower or a near direct lightning strike. This may slow your vertical movement, but ask yourself this question. If I misplace a clamp, can I flap my arms fast enough to slow my fall to a safe speed? Let's review this simple procedure one more time. You will use two climbing straps to attach to the tower. Always clamp these two straps to different places on the tower, never to the same tower part. From a standstill, unhook one strap and step up one or two rungs until the other strap is around your knees. Then clamp the first strap as high as you can reach. Now, reach down and unhook the lower strap. Step up until the now higher strap is about knee height and reach up and clamp on with the loose one. By using shoulder harness and waist belts and using this method, you will always be connected to the tower while climbing. Remember to follow the dual attachment safety rule while clamped onto the tower when you intend to let go of the tower and lean fully into your belt. Always clamp onto two different places. When using duplicate strap attachments, you effectively reduce the chances of a fatal fall by nearly half. That's a cheap and cost-effective insurance policy you can write for yourself. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The German National Amateur Radio Society, DARC, has made available a comprehensive list of the amateur radio allocations for the CEPT Class 1 and CEPT Novice licenses in all of the signatory countries. CEPT is the European Conference of Postal and Telecommunications. It was established in 1959 by 19 European states as a coordinating body for European state telecommunications and postal organisations. The CEPT licence is based on the simple idea that radio operations can be carried out during a short stay in another country without having to apply for a guest licence for this country. There are two CEPT recommendations for this, which, however, only apply in the respective country if it has been implemented in national law there. The first recommendation describes the CEPT Class 1 radio amateur licence. It corresponds to the German Class A licence. The second recommendation concerns the novice radio amateur licence, which corresponds to the German Class E licence. The new DARC list contains the operating parameters for short-term operation in the relevant countries, including frequency ranges, power classes, operating modes and similar. You can download the list from www.darc.de. The CEPT Class 1 license is also equivalent to the USA Extra license and the Novice level is equivalent to the USA General class. Many CEPT member countries have also implemented an entry-level license, equivalent to the USA Technician class. While the UK has not yet joined in with other countries in permitting amateur entry-level or novice reciprocal operation, UK Foundation and intermediate license holders can operate when they're on holiday in many other countries, if they first contact the national regulator by email and ask for permission. Here is this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars, a members-only benefit. To register, check on upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions, please visit the ARRL Learning Network webinar page. Learning with High Altitude Balloons, hosted by Jack McElroy, KM4ZIA, and Audrey McElroy, KM4BUN is scheduled for Thursday, July 22nd, 2021 at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 1930 UTC. Jack McElroy, KM4ZIA, and Audrey McElroy, KM4BUN discuss their experiences with high-altitude balloons and explain how others can launch them successfully. The discussion will also focus on using high-altitude balloons to engage youth in ham radio and create learning experiences for students. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded Learning Network webinars. 
ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, measuring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change. Check the ARRL Learning Network webpage for the latest schedule. The 40th Annual ARRL Tapper Digital Communications Conference will be held online September 17th and 18th. Registered Digital Communications Conference attendees participating via Zoom will be able to interact with presenters and other attendees via a chat room and have the option to raise a virtual hand to ask questions. You may register to attend, but non-registered participants can view the live stream on YouTube at no cost, as well as chat and ask questions via the moderator monitoring the channel. Registration is free for Tapper members and $30 for non-members. Members receive a 100% discount at checkout. Non-members who would like to join Tapper and receive the free Digital Communications Conference Pass can add Tapper membership and digital communications conference registration to their shopping carts. After checkout, they will receive the free digital communications conference pass when their membership is processed. The digital communications conference is soliciting technical papers for presentation and for publication in the conference proceedings. Authors do not need to participate in the conference to have their papers included in the proceedings. The submission deadline for papers is August 15th. Submit papers via email to Matty Weinberg, KB1EIB. Papers will be published exactly as submitted and authors will retain all rights. Conference papers will be distributed as PDFs to participants. Printed copies of the papers will be available for sale at Lulu. Speakers are invited to deliver presentations on topics of interest without submitting papers for the conference proceedings. All speakers and presenters should contact Steve Bible, N7HPR, to reserve a slot for a presentation. Indicate whether you need a 15 or 30 minute slot and whether you need to present on a specific day. A pre-recorded presentation may be submitted in lieu of a live virtual presentation. Paper and presentation topic areas include, but are not limited to, software-defined radio, digital voice, digital satellite communication, digital signal processing, HF digital modes, adapting IEEE 802.11 systems for amateur radio, global positioning systems, automatic position reporting system, Linux and amateur radio, AX Doc 25 updates, Internet Operability with Amateur Radio Networks, TCP IP Networking over Amateur Radio, Mesh and Peer-to-Peer -peer Wireless Networking, Emergency and Homeland Defense, and Backup Digital Communications Using Amateur Radio. Ad hoc lightning talks on various topics of interest will be announced throughout the conference, and registered attendees will be able to participate in any lightning talk that interests them. Hardware and software demonstrations will be conducted during the Digital Communications Conference by means of Zoom's breakout room feature. How about powering your own portable station simply by using your body instead of a battery? Researchers in Israel say that this makes more sense than you may think. Researchers call it the piezoelectricity and it's been around for quite a while. The accumulation of electrical charges from solid materials is actually not a new concept, at least in the laboratory. Now researchers at Tel Aviv University believe this nanotechnology will one day be able to power medical devices such as pacemakers by transforming the body's mechanical movements into electricity. That's because they discovered a way to do this using materials that are non-toxic, making them safe for implantation into the human body. The research was published recently in the journal Nature Communications. Now the time has come for this to be tried on humans. The lead researcher, Professor Ehud Ghazid, said the practical applications extend beyond medicine. He said the device would also power street lights simply by being placed on the road to capture energy from tire movements. We hams, of course, will be watching and waiting for the results of this new development in green energy. For those of us who operate portable or mobile, it certainly puts all kinds of possibilities for power in motion. And of course, we all remember the crystal microphone, which operates on the piezoelectrics principle.
There's an article in a recent edition of the Minnesota Star Tribune reporting on radio amateur twins, 86-year-old Janet Kilo Zero Juliet Echo and Janice Kilo Zero Juliet Alpha. The article tells the story of the two identical twins who studied electrical engineering and worked for pioneering computer companies at a time when few women had careers in science and technology. They have travelled the world via the airways as avid ham radio operators, a hobby that they took up in their teens, and they've also travelled the world in real life, driving a series of RVs to every USA state except Hawaii, and taking volunteer trips to places like Tonga and Indonesia. The sisters have a wide variety of interests, including photography, bowling, and of course ham radio, but they also like to compete. They win prizes for their wildlife photography, and they like collecting rankings and certificates from amateur radio competitions. They exchange Morse code transmissions at 20 words a minute with other amateur radio operators, and they try to contact ham radio operators located in as many of the American national parks as possible. They've also contacted people over the airwaves in about 200 countries, but they're still looking for more. A ham radio operator friend, Lal Kola, Kilo Zero Lima Romeo, said that in some eyes Morse code is almost a lost art, but the twins are expert Morse operators. You can read the full story at www.startribune.com. And finally this week, a significant event in the history of technology happened this week in a past so quietly that we almost missed it. The last few remaining NTSC transmitters in the USA finally came off air, marking the end of over seven decades of continuous 525-line American analog TV broadcasts. We've previously reported on the output of these channels, largely the so-called Franken-FM stations, left over after the 2009 digital switchover, whose sound carrier lay at the bottom of the FM dial as radio stations and noted their impending demise. We've even reported on some of the intricacies of the NTSC system, but we've never taken a look at what will replace these last few Franken-FM stations. If you're an American, you may have heard of ATSC 3.0, perhaps by its marketing name of NextGen TV. Just like the DVB-T2 standard found in other parts of the world, it's an upgrade to digital TV standards to allow for more recent video compression technologies and higher definition broadcasts. It has an interesting backwards compatibility feature, absent in previous ATSC versions. There is the option of narrowing the digital bandwidth from 6 MHz to 5.5 MHz and transmitting an analog FM subcarrier where the old NTSC sound carrier on the same channel would have sat. Thus, the Franken FM stations have the option of upgrading to ATSC 3.0 and transmitting a digital channel package alongside their existing FM radio station. The inexorable march of technology has thus given better quality TV alongside the retention of the Franken FMs. We have to admit to being sorry to see the passing of analog TV. It was an intricate and fascinating system that provided a testbed for plenty of experimentation back in the day. Perhaps as we see it slip over the horizon, it's worth pondering whether its digital replacement will also become an anachronism in an age of on-demand streaming TV. After all, it shouldn't have escaped most people's attention that in 2021, the good TV content no longer comes to your screen via an antenna socket. Meanwhile, we'll keep our CRTs running, just in case we ever want to relive a 1980s night in with a VHS tape of Back to the Future. NTSC in America fades to black. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD Repeater System on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until...